Brooklyn. From, from Brooklyn, New York? Yes, Brooklyn. And um, I gather they're still looking for your husband. I'm still looking for him. He worked uh, um, on the 104th floor at Cantor Fitzgerald's. And I've, I've recently heard from people on the floor uh, that they know of three survivors from his floor in Jersey hospitals, but I don't know which hospital. And have you tried to get in touch with the hospitals? Uh, I have a wonderful neighborhood, and they're all calling the hospitals, and nobody seems to have my husband's name or anyone else's name. And it, have, you, have you been able to see on television some of the hotline numbers which appear that you can call for information? I have called the cancer hotline, and my husband's name is still not listed on that line, on that hotline, and... Uh, I, I've been calling everything possibly, but there are a lot of busy signals, and it's very hard to get through. And I just, I, I just really want to know if anyone has any information on cancer people, because they were up on the hundreds in the first building that was hit by the plane. And I just want to know that a lot of people from those upper floors made it, and which hospitals they're in. Well, Ms. Galligan, I, I, I am in the dreadful position of not being able to help you very much, I and, I, and, and I, I know you know that, and I wonder if it's, uh, I mean, I, I hope it's a, a, a benefit to you and other people of deep concern, um, uh, deeply concerned at the moment, uh, to, to at least have your names on television um, so that s somebody may be aware, based on what you said, that your husband is missing. Have you got a pencil handy? Yes, a pencil. Um, I, I have... Um, we have some numbers. I'm going to ask our, our control room to look. I have only um, one number in my notes at the moment, and I know there are other numbers. We'll get them up for you and other people. But 1-800-331-0071. One is a number that I have in my... Um, well, actually, are you anywhere near a television screen at the moment? Uh, I didn't know if I could put it on. I could put it on? Well, you can certainly put it on. Okay. Maybe you want to keep the sound down for a second. But you raise a very good down. point. Um, you raise a very good point. Here is some health information uh, on the television screen at the moment. The first number the, for, for victims of crime. Um, this may not uh, be directly pertinent to your husband, but there are some two telephone numbers. There's one telephone number because unless you're giving a, a tip to the FBI, you don't want to be using the second one. Um, but I think perhaps by getting, by getting your husband's name, your husband's name I know is Donald. Donald Gavigan. G. A. V. A. G. A. N. And the two, two of the people that supposedly are in Jersey hospitals, Mark and Stephen Kaleo, you know, they were really close, all three of them. So I'm hoping my husband didn't have a wallet on him and he is with Mark and Stephen because knowing those three, they wouldn't separate. You know, so I'm hoping they found Mark and Stephen Kaleo and, and they'll find Donald Gavigan. Now, do you believe that they have found Mark and Stephen safe? Uh, Stephen... Once again, we keep trying to bring you the best of the coverage out of America at present. We leave ABC America there and take you back to CNN's coverage. That meeting uh, concluded inconclusively diplomatic language but not a positive outcome. What happened after that almost immediately we received a call from the senior Taliban spokesman, Abdul Hai Mutmain, with a new message from the Taliban, again condemning the attack in the United States, calling it a sad humanitarian catastrophe, saying that they had the sympathy of the people of the United States. But going beyond any Taliban statement so far, he said they appealed to the United States not to attack Afghanistan. They said the people of Afghanistan are already in a great deal of misery. They said that killing the leaders of the Taliban in Afghanistan, they said, would not help the people of Afghanistan. He went on to say that any attack on Afghanistan would cause resentment within the region that would be a negative thing. He also talked about Osama bin Laden. He said Osama bin Laden had a following of the people. He said that the press record of Osama bin Laden often attributed things to him that were perhaps weren't relevant. This all this message, all this statement wrapped up by the final line appealing to the United States saying they hoped that sanity prevailed in the United States. Now putting together the diplomatic jigsaw that's happened here, Lou, a failed diplomatic meeting with senior Taliban officials where an international message was passed to the Taliban, 
the Taliban shortly afterwards then releasing a statement appealing to the United States not to attack Afghanistan, not to kill its leaders, to think seriously about the consequences of any action in this region, and the Taliban saying they hope sanity in the United States prevails. Lou? Uh, Nick, as you uh, know, the United States has appealed to Afghanistan a number of times to extradite Osama bin Laden to the United States uh, for... Uh, prosecution in connection with the wor first World Trade Center bombing and the uh, bombings of the U.S. embassies in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Do you know if there's been any further attempts by the United States to ask for that extradition and what the answer to that might have been? Lou, one of the questions we had for our diplomatic sources today was what was in that message that was passed by the Pakistani official to the Taliban official. Uh, we could not get any comment on what that message was. We only know that it was delivered and that the message was, the meeting was, in quote, inconclusive. Um, it is highly likely that in any scenario regarding uh, talks, international talks with the Taliban, the issue of Osama bin Laden would come up. The United Nations has placed sanctions on uh, the Taliban for failing to hand over Osama bin Laden as requested. United Nations today pulled out all its international staff from Afghanistan. It's done this at times of high tension before, but a key difference today when the United Nations staff pulled out, last of them to leave early tomorrow morning, when they pulled out today, they paid off all their local staff. They took their computer software disks and unusually they took a lot of their hard copy key documents as well with them loose. Nick Robinson on the ground in the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul, where uh, the Taliban has been meeting and has again con uh, condemned yesterday's terrorist attacks in the United States and has pleaded with the United States of America not to attack its country. Natalie? And there were, of course, four ill-fated flights yesterday uh, that ended in disaster. One of those flights landed in Pennsylvania, crashed in Pennsylvania, Somerset County. It was a United Airlines Flight 93 out of Newark, New Jersey. Its intended destination was San Francisco. Of course, it never made it. Uh, sometime when it was turning back toward the east to a destination unknown, it did crash. We have from the location CNN's Brian Cabell. He's there along with so many investigators trying to put the pieces together to what happened with this one. Brian, what can you tell us? Well, Natalie, the recovery operation is well underway right now. We're told there are 80 investigators out in a field about a half mile behind me, combing those fields, mapping and greeting the fields, and starting to pick up some of the debris. But we have been warned that what they are finding is very small, tiny in some cases. We're talking about both debris and human remains. There were 45 people on board this plane. The largest piece, we were told by one official, was a part of a jet engine. Of course, the top priority right now is to find the black box. The FBI official who talked to us about an hour ago said they had not yet found it. They had not heard a beacon from it yet. That was not especially promising. And Congressman John Murtha, who is from this area, spoke to us a couple of hours ago. He said he spoke to some searchers earlier today, and he said they were pessimistic about finding the black box. I personally think that uh, this black box in this incident could be a key because I think Personally, there was a struggle in that airplane before it hit the ground, and uh, somebody made a heroic effort to keep that from uh, hitting uh, uh, a populated area. Congressman Murtha also mentioned that he noticed in the last month or so increased security around the Pentagon and also at two U.S. military installations outside of D.C. He's not sure what to attribute that to. As for the scene here, as I say, it's about a half mile behind me. We're told it's a three-mile perimeter. There's a crater in the middle of it, eight, by eight to ten feet deep, we've been told. And the search, we're told, may take between three and five weeks. The big question remaining here, of course, Natalie, is where was this plane going? Left Newark around 8 a.m., went to the Cleveland airspace, turned around, came back east. They thought it might go into Pittsburgh, thought it might go into Johnstown, a little bit north of here, but then ended up in a field as I say, in rural Somerset County. The question is, was there a fight on the plane? Did someone deliberately turn this plane down into this field? I'm Brian Cabell, CNN Live in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Brian Cabell, thank you. Will we ever know as investigators look for the black box there? We'll stay in touch with Brian for any further developments. We want to turn now to Patty Davis. She's in Washington. She's got more about when airports might be open in this country. Of course, Patty, they 
were scheduled to get planes off the air more than an hour ago. Where do we stand? Well, that was originally their, their target in terms of the earliest possible time, 12 noon Eastern time, when they might reopen the U.S. airspace. But that has slipped. Uh, the FAA saying that, uh, that it uh, doesn't have a hard time now at this point. But uh, one uh, FAA official saying that we expect to hear from the Department of Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta about that uh, sometime today, as well as security measures. Now, the FAA is requiring all airports to beef up security measures effective today. That is before they can resume operations and scheduled flights. Uh, some of those include, uh, in terms of knives, uh, prior to today, uh, passengers were allowed to carry even pocket knives up to four inches uh, on board airliners, U.S. airliners, that will no longer be allowed at the FAA saying that no knives of any kind, metal or non-metal, will be allowed on any flight. You cannot carry that at least on board. You can put it in your, in your luggage that gets checked, but you can't carry it into the sterile environment of the cabin. Now, they're also going to discontinue curbside check-in at airports, uh, also discontinuing off-airport check-in. Sometimes you can check in uh, from uh, different locations, a train, et cetera, uh, somewhere. You don't actually have to go to the, to the, uh, to the check-in counter. You will have to now. Also, uh, use of federal air marshals. Now, those have been used for quite some years. Uh, they are armed. They're trained to use lethal force and thwart hijackers, thwart incidents. Uh, they uh, are used currently on some flights that are considered heightened alert, but uh, the FAA is saying that it will continue to use federal air marshals traveling on airlines. Also, uh, there will be more officers on duty at airports, and also you're going to see more uh, checks on passengers as well. Also, higher standards for screeners. Now, the FAA is trying to expedite, push through a rule that uh, gives them the authority over screeners. Now, right now, uh, they, they don't directly regulate uh, when you go through passenger screening, the people who are screening your bags. The airlines do that. And what they're trying to change is uh, that they would have direct control over those screeners. So all those companies, those contractors that operate those companies would report to the FAA and have to meet heightened FAA standards. Also, uh, we've been told that a source close to the airline industry is telling the FAA, calling, the FAA, uh, calling on the FAA to nationalize or federalize uh, those, uh, those security checkpoints at, at airports, put uh, federal officials, federal law enforcement officials in place there. And uh, the FAA would not comment on that. Natalie? So these sound like...